press play on the inside inside sales show powered by the sales iq network my name is daryl prail i'm your host and you my friend will you and i we're going on a journey every single week talking to the industry's most accomplished sales legends as they share with us their tips their tricks their techniques and their tactics to become sales rock stars you simply need to do what they're doing and you will achieve similar nirvana if you like to laugh, if you like to be entertained, if you like to go off on tangents and tell stories, you're gonna love what you're gonna hear next. Sit back, relax, it's gonna get real. How is it going, everybody? Another episode here of the Inside, Inside Sales Show. I am so glad you're back, and I'll tell you why I'm glad, because you're tuning in, and this is gonna be a special episode. It's gonna be a special episode for a lot of reasons. Uh, I get to hang out today with a a dude, a a fellow, a, another member of the Commonwealth, uh, a lad who has uh, walked very much alongside me in my journey in the last five or so years. Well, he himself has had a fantastic journey. So let me set the stage a little bit, and then and then I'll I'll let you know who this character is. You all know him, and if you don't. You have been living under a rock. Yes, that's my teaser today. Kids were worth royalty. Okay, just hold that thought. Um, I'm going to go back in time. And, and I'm going back in time to share a story with you if you've, not, if you've not heard this story. I think I've shared it, but it's been a long time. When I first joined VanillaSoft, obviously now I'm the CMO at Agora Pulse, but when I first joined VanillaSoft, you know, give or take five years ago, about three months into the gig, I went to my CEO and I said, uh, here's the thing, Mr. CEO. People these days aren't buying from nameless, faceless corporations. They're buying from other people. So even though I, Daryl, you know, was representing VanillaSoft, just like you, uh, Johnny and Sally sales rep, are representing your specific employers, People don't buy from the nameless entity. They buy from you, Johnny and Sally. That's who they buy from. And I said to my CEO at the time, I said, we need to establish a brand, uh, a voice, a personality, a subject matter expert uh, on behalf of our company that people can connect with and relate to. And that person will become not only a source of new leads, but they'll become a source of objection handling as they start to wonder, is this the right company I want to buy this solution, this service from? Oh, wait, I know that personality. I like them. Yes, this is the company I want to buy it from. And, uh, and my CEO looked at me and he said, so what are you saying? I'm saying, nobody here is stepping up to be that voice and that personality, so I'm thinking it's going to be me. I will do it. That was my job. I was hired there as a CMO at the time. I did eventually become the CRO. Um, and I said, I think it's me. And he's like, so are you saying that now we're not, are we investing in our corporate social profiles and visibility and brand, but now we're investing in Daryl Prail? And I said, yes. And he had this look of sheer pain on his face. And I said, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that I will have some notoriety and some success that you will have paid for and then I will leave or that it will become Daryl Prail and not Vanilla Soft. And he's like, yes, to all of that. And I said, I'll manage that. And don't worry, I'm not going to leave. And if I am going to leave, you should pay me more money and that problem goes away. So there we go. So there you have it. That was the catalyst. And I recognize the time that for our audience of Vanilla Soft, LinkedIn was the right channel. Now, maybe it's Instagram, or maybe it's Facebook, or maybe it's Twitter, or maybe it's a combination thereof. Things have evolved since then. But I recognize that up to that point in time, I'd only use LinkedIn as a glorified resume, a CV. That was it. And I really didn't have any expertise on how to do that. So I started reaching out to people who I could learn from on the fly. And that is what led me to this cat. And I recognize by studying him, what he was, I saw some of what he was doing. He'll share some of his, his lessons today. But I recognize that one of the biggest things about social, if you're truly trying to build up a personal brand and your reach, is that you can do that by leveraging other people's audiences. All right, so it's not just about your brand, it's about your reach. And so this fellow and I first got together in a grand debate, and I was the most nervous I'd ever been. I don't know if I've ever told him this. 
uh, at my time at VanillaSoft where I was up against this fellow. And we had over a thousand people online. And the debate was, is it social selling or not? You know, it's social, I can't remember the verbatim, but it was about social selling. And it was like, is it really social selling? And I contended at the time it was social marketing. This individual contended it was social selling. And we had a fantastic conversation. And I was so scared. And we took a survey before we began about who we thought was going to win. And we took a survey afterwards. And yes, he still won. But it went from like being 90 to 10 that, that he was going to win to being like 55, 45 at the end of the day that he, that he won. So I, I called that a victory. And we've had a great friendship ever since then. I've been a big fan. He has been wonderful. He's quoted me on a couple of his books where he gives me credit. Although I don't think the most recent one because he's too big for me now. He's like all Hollywood. He's like Kanye meets Pete Davidson. And I'm still, you know, I'm the guy in, in, the, in, the, in the cabin by the pool. That's me. So, you know, life goes in different directions. If you don't know who I'm talking about, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Daniel Disney. My friend, how are you? Daryl, that is one of the craziest introductions I think I've ever had on a podcast, but it is so good to think back to our journey from, I mean, we'd built up a bit of a friendship before that debate, but I remember that debate. It was the day before I was due to go on holiday. You know, we had suitcases packed and I was like, right, I just need to do this debate before we fly and, you know, take this family break. And I was nervous. A thousand people, Daryl, we had a huge crowd, but it was huge so much audience. fun because... I think what brings us together is our equal passion for all things sales, marketing, selling, social, everything. And so your friendship is extremely valuable to me and I cannot wait to chat with you again and kind of get an update because we haven't done this for a while. We have not done this for a while. It's been crazy. And for those who don't know, uh, Daniel's got very humble beginnings. You know, he was just... He got into sales at a young age. He had an uncle who was a big influence in, in his life, taught him some of the tricks of the trade. Uh, if I recall, you were selling, uh, you were in a, in a major home fix-it store, teaching people how to build kitchens and, and whatnot and selling all that stuff. So, you know, true, true grassroots selling. And, and I, what I love about Daniel's story is he's a self-made guy who figured this out on his own. And I mean, last I saw, You've got an audience of over 800,000 people. And, and is that the right latest and greatest number? Is it bigger? Like, what's it at right now? Uh, we're just past 850,000. We're, we're on our way to 900,000. So just a small little accomplishment. So, you know, here's the thing. When everybody says to me, yeah, I can't do that. Or that's not me. Daniel did that. And that is Daniel. And he's as humble today and is willing to share today as he's always been. He's got two books out. I don't know if you know this, with the Million Pound LinkedIn Message, fantastic book that came out uh, a few years ago now. And then in the last year, he had the Ultimate LinkedIn Sales Guide. So I thought we'd keep today's conversation. Normally, I like to have, you know, what's the takeaway, right? And I've got a theme. And I thought today, because if you just hadn't talked in so long, you all can listen to us jam. And, and we're just going to talk about the state of social and, and what it means to sales and what's changed and what's not changed. So if that's okay with you boys and girls, uh, I would multitask at the same time. What I would do is I would go and follow Daniel on LinkedIn. All right, please do that. He is the king of social selling. Love that new uh, banner you have on your on your profile, brother. That's well done. Um, you should go buy his books. They're, they are available in, uh, in uh, e-books, if I recall, so you can get it either way. Uh, although, personally, I love the hardcover uh, and the paperback, depending on what you got. I have a personally signed copy, boys and girls. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, with that, Daniel, so what, in the last, since COVID, COVID came, changed the way things kind of went down. Communities got really big. It got loud. It got noisy. If we were starting from scratch today, we, you, neither you or I would probably have the same success we had starting pre-COVID, doing all this community building, relationship building. Um, what's changed and what advice would you give today to somebody using LinkedIn or social selling as a channel that either that's different, that's different, that's different from what you might have given before. Let's go with that. You're right, Daryl. It is a lot noisier than it used to be. I think LinkedIn has never been more noisy, which has its pros and cons. But I will 
you mentioned it's not as easy for someone to come onto LinkedIn now as it might have been for us several years ago. And actually, I still see people come out of nowhere on LinkedIn in 2022, no personal brands and build great communities and audiences. It's still happening. I think what has changed is the level of creativity and originality required. I think you need to find your voice, your thing, something different that you can bring to the table a lot quicker than perhaps you used to. But the formula's still the same. You know, the activities are still the same. It's just you need to stand out, which can be scary, but we're each individual. We each have our individual things we bring to the table, whether it's a red T-shirt, whether it's a glorious white beard. You know, there's different (laughs) things we can bring. (laughs) So what chicken and egg? What comes first? Do I go and, 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 and connect with and follow thousands of people before I start doing content? Or do I start doing content and then those thousands of people follow me? You can do both. It's, it's whatever you're comfortable with, Daryl. Let's be fair. Some of the people listening to this, they're not comfortable creating content. So start first by following people, consuming, and maybe commenting and, and build up to finding your voice. Others will come into LinkedIn and be happy sharing content straight away. I, I've learned from you know speaking and working with lots and lots of people around the world there are different types of people. There is no right or wrong. You've just got to do what you're comfortable with at first. I think the key common denominator is be active on LinkedIn, whether that's consuming, whether that's creating, just start spending more time, being more consistent, whether you know what your voice is or you don't, just sitting on LinkedIn uh, on a daily basis is going to help you find your place and build up that confidence. Does LinkedIn work if I'm not selling into high tech SaaS? It does. It's an advantage if you are selling into high tech SaaS, which is definitely (laughs) the the boom space right now. But honestly, people are selling anything and everything to anyone and everyone. I mean, Daryl, you've seen it. LinkedIn is growing. I mean, we are close to a billion users and it is heavy B2B, but it's now becoming B2C. It's just expanding massively people are using it 24 7 evenings weekends you know we are really you know engrossed in in linkedin so it is for everyone but yes if you are in SaaS, even better now i could be naive it could be just because of the company i keep i get a vibe that b2b uh sales is a community that is just tight massive receptive you may or may or not disagree. I'll let you opine shortly. Do you believe that's the case in other segments? So for example, I went to Agorapulse. So Agorapulse, instead of me selling like a vanilla software, but it sold to the salespeople because we're selling sales tech. At Agorapulse, I'm talking to the marketers I'm talking because I'm selling marketing tech. And I'm not convinced that the marketing audience is as active or as tight as the sales audience. But that could be a byproduct of the fact that uh, a vast majority of my connections are sales centric. So maybe I'm mistaken, but I po- I posit to you, are other buyers, in my example, the marketing buyers, are those communities there or do you see a disproportionate bias in the sales buying community? Do you know what? I will respectfully disagree, Daryl. Yes, I think you can right. respect. <laughs> nobody respects me to start with. Okay. Let's start with that. Okay. You can just say, pro, you're full of shit and I'm okay with that. Daryl, this is where our British Canadian conversations get overly <laughs> polite. We know it's going to happen. This is never going to be yes. an aggressive conversation. Um, I see it. There is a hierarchy. In first place, you've got recruiters. The recruitment industry on LinkedIn is the top dog. The engagement they get, the buying, selling going on. Recruitment's number one. Second place is marketing. And, and I see this. Marketing content, marketing thought leaders, you know, that whole section industry on on LinkedIn is second place. And I would put sales in third place. Um, It's close between sales and marketing, but I think marketing gets just that a little bit more uh, because LinkedIn is a social media network and is always going to have a bit of an edge from a marketing perspective. But that's personally what I see to anyone listening and or or watching this. If you disagree, you know, feel free to to hit us up in the messages and, and let us know your views. But that's that's personally what I see. Is Chris Walker the marketing equivalent of Daniel Disney? <laughs> I, I, I'm i sure like you, Daryl, I have a massive uh, sort of man crush on Chris Walker. What a guy he is. Um, I mean, yeah, I would honestly, honorably take that comparison. He is awesome. 
Um, marketing has quite a few, though. You, you've got Chris. Um, now I can't think of it because I'm on the spot, but you and I know lots of big names in, in marketing. Yeah, Daniel Murray. Daniel example, Murray. You got, you got people like Dave Gerhardt and others who they've, they've marked on Patreon, Route, and Twitter than they have LinkedIn as much. At least that's been my observation. But, yeah. Uh, um, question. Let me throw one at you. I've never asked you this question before. So I don't know how you're going to react if you're going to just scrunch your eyes or not. All right? All right. I'm ready. What's, here we go. Because we do all this. Obviously, we do it for personal brand and credibility. But we also do this to generate, you know, obviously, uh, for a large part, a new business. Let's talk about dark social. So we he's, see, I got, I got an eyebrow. So let me explain for those who are wondering what dark social is. So dark social is a bit of a marketing term, but I know Dana's going to be there shortly. So dark social is the premise that content is made to be shared. That's the first thing you need to understand. You're making content so it gets shared, like a video or an ebook or something. And when that gets shared, eventually somebody clicks on that to see it. And it takes it into a company's website. So it could be in the bowels of a website because it's, a, it's buried somewhere, right? You're sharing this piece of content. It's not on the homepage. Marketers like to know where their traffic comes from. So if it's coming to a landing page, like a webinar, then we say, oh, well, that, that, you know, that, that attribution of our spend, you know, we can say we got ROI because of the, the traffic on that landing page. Or if it goes to our homepage and we say, that's organic. You Google something, you found our homepage. But when it goes into the bowels of the website, well, we know you're not probably finding that by simple Google search. And we know, so how, so it's not really organic. You got here somehow. And how you got there was because that's where that piece of content that was shared when you clicked on took you to. Dark social. I don't know where that came from. In other words, the piece of content you put out that got shared, 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 and shared again. A marketer wants to go and spend money if I've got a whole bunch of traction on this, I want to spend more money on that, but it's dark. It's a dark social share. I don't, I don't know where to spend more money. So the takeaway here, to bring it back, is I'm really asking you, what are your thoughts on the power of compelling content that gets shared and reshared and reshared to drive your own personal brand, your own personal reach, and your pipeline building efforts? It's is funny. content that important? Or is content simply people being pithy with their leadership starts with you stupid ass comments that annoys the hell out of me nonstop. oh daryl i knew our conversation would get to this sort of point where we start to uh open up about the things that frustrate us most on linkedin and i agree there is some bland content um i mean whilst whilst we're on that topic daryl before i answer the question I'll, I'll open about some of my personal bugbears of content at the minute um at the minute i'm noticing a lot of and I want to tread on this very sensitively, but the sure. over the overuse of either serious personal challenges, mental health, yep. serious personal issues, where I fully understand it's good to talk, it's good to connect and to give people a voice and to help connect other people in those scenarios. I'm I'm all for I genuinely I do have sympathy and, and empathy. What I sometimes see is people overusing those things because they do drive. Yep viral engagement and i think there is a risk if you do too much of that type of content yes you'll grow a big audience and you'll get lots of engagement but will that convert into business and to trust and to you know professional respect i think there's a very there's a, there's a fine balance and at the moment i see a lot of people maybe just pushing it for the engagement and then suggesting other people do the same thing because they get engagement yep. that's how you get engagement anyway that's me just offloading one of my recent observations going off of your similar one around uh, you're not the first person i've heard say that i mean and and i'll be a little less sensitive than daniel with no disrespect to those who are going through uh mental um health challenges i have family very close to me who can live this every day so i understand i live it but i i, I mean Benjamin Dennehy the other day made some kind of post like, oh, you've got a mental health challenge. Suck it up. So does everybody else. Now, only De only Benjamin Dennehy could say that, right? Because that's his MO, folks. He's the UK's most hated sales trainer. But it was interesting to see the reaction that people had to that. So, I, but to your point, what I hate about what you're saying is how people are actually 
exploiting that for their own selfish gains, which is, I know what you're saying. And I find that uh, just obnoxious. Yeah, it's it's a very slippery slope. And you, you and I know, and going back to the whole topic around content, dark social, you know, when content does well, it does feed your ego and growing an audience, becoming a brand, you know, it, it, it's, it can be hard to manage, to, to, to remain humble, to keep grounded, to keep focused. It's, it's a very emotional journey. And so I, I get what causes people to think, oh, this has worked. Let's do more of this. Yeah, but sometimes different. taking a step back and looking at that big picture and, and thinking long term of the impacts. What it ties into, Daryl, and this will be my la hopefully my last complaint. I don't like to complain. It, ta it taps into that mindset of it's who I am. And if you don't like it, Go away. This is who I am. Yes. I can say what I want. Yep. I can do what I want because this is me. And this really bizarre, ego-driven, disguised as empowerment type mentality that is quite dangerous, especially whether you adapt it in real life or on social media. I think it's, yeah, it's risky. I see it a lot with when swearing was a bit of a hot topic and people that <laughs> swore would be like, it's okay. That's I swear. And if you don't like it, then go find someone who doesn't swear. And Let's be really frank with this. Unless you have too much business and you're so rich and wealthy that you genuinely don't need more customers, which isn't those people, why would you want to scare people away? Why wouldn't you want to just tone it down? I don't know. I, if you guys are interested, go back to the Vanilla Soft website I, and look for a webinar that I did with Keenan. Keenan and I had this did, phenomenal did. webinar several years ago. And, and that was actually the number one reason we had the webinar. And I, I hammered him on it. I'm like, it was about his swearing. I helped me understand. And does this work for you? And by the end, I'm swearing too, not nearly as much as he's doing it. And he was like, see, you're doing it. It's just who you are. And I'm like, no, I'm reacting. I'm, I'm adapting to whom you are, reality is. But the, the fact of it is, I asked him that question, why would you want to potentially alienate business when it's so easily avoidable? And his response was just, this is who I am. If you don't do business with me, that's fine. And that's your choice. You know, that yeah. is your choice. But I'm with you. I'm like, why? Why Why would you literally put a roadblock in front of yourself when you don't have to? But uh, so anyway, it was a great conversation. Check it out. A couple years old, but it was good. No, it was, um, it was really good. And it's a good topic. And I'm with you, Daryl. I think as salespeople, for all the salespeople listening to this, I've personally always, similar to you, Daryl, I adapt to the person I'm speaking to. If they want to swear, yes. I'll swear. I mean, I don't swear a lot, but I'll happily. But... I'm not going to do it to offend them. I saw someone who um, said a very rude word on a social media post and someone commented saying, you know, I've been buying from you for a couple of years, but I don't like that language and I won't buy from you again. And it's, right. you know, it, that was avoidable. That didn't need to happen. But anyway, we digress. We've gone off track. Um, well, but we actually, we're not digressing. I would argue that, you know, your image, guys and gals on LinkedIn is exactly this. We're talking about... It's not just the content. Of course, content is king. Don't get us wrong in adding value. But at the end of the day, people are connecting with you because they value you as a person. It's a relationship. It's a selling, right? So you 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 will attract the people that you, you know, the kind of the personality you you project a little bit. I project intentionally a somewhat more direct speech. I'm not Benjamin Dennehy direct, but I am more a blunt person. Daniel projects a very, very wise, likable person, and that's whom he is. And he's a, you know, his 850,000 followers says they like that, right? So there you go, right? So it's, it's the whole package on social. It is, it's a little complex. It's content, it's value, it's personality. You know, I tell you, folks, when I'm on social and I'm doing video, I'm wearing these glasses on purpose because they look good on video. These are not the glasses I wear around the house. All right. So that gives you some context. I woke up this morning going, I'm going to be recording with Daniel Disney. I better put on a shirt that makes me look, you know, 20 pounds lighter because that's what you do. Right. I don't have his felt figure with social <laughs> selling. So there we well, go. Well, I, I don't wear this um, around the house either, Daryl. You know, this is put on <laughs> uh, for these scenarios. I don't live in red, um, although I do seem to be buying a lot more red things recently. My red barbecue. It's weird how that is. Point out. I know it's a yeah subliminal thing, but let's no, it's bring true. it right back. Uh, just going yep. back, Daryl, you, you talk about dark social. Does content work? How do you, you track it? And we were talking about this before we went live. You know, how can you how can you measure it? You put out content. 
you know, it's hard to yeah. track it all the way. I think technology, uh, as you know, is going to, you know, fix some of those problems as time goes on. But yes, it does have an impact. And whether you find a way to, to track it or you try to, to track it, it is very visible when you have individuals, salespeople, SDRs, AEs and companies growing audiences, 10, 20, 30,000 plus getting hundreds or thousands of likes on their comments, getting loads of messages on their inbox. You know, the impact isn't just on them. It's around the whole company. Some companies don't even have that many followers on their company page. So it isn't too hard to see the impact content has personal branding has what I think we're in a transition stage of is how we measure that better and start to get a better understanding of it. Because I understand it. You're a company, you're a CMO, you're a CRO. You want to know what your spend is going on and what the ROI is. I think it's just a transition phase. Would you agree? I agree. I entirely agree with that. I just wanted to throw the word dark social out just because I said it. So, you know, hip. It's, um, it's May the 4th, Daryl. It's a good topic to have. It's May the 4th. You got it. May the 4th be with you. And for those <laughs> listening to this, we recorded this on May the 4th. Um, so here's a, a question for you. I am a sales rep. I am one or two years, three years max into my gig. Um, and I'm only now recognizing that I need to invest more time in my social selling uh, endeavors. What advice, guidance do you have for me? Because I'm a little bit scared, I'm a little bit nervous, and I'm not sure anybody wants to hear any content that I have to put out there. There you go. Boom. Go. Easy two first steps. Number one, just start growing your network. Just start adding more people, customers, industry people, just on a daily basis, start to grow your audience. Then step two is an easy first step. Start scrolling through your feed two, three times a week. Find posts that connect with you that you enjoy and just start adding comments. Even if at the start, it just has to be a great post. Start with that, but then start to try and find ways to contribute to add your thoughts or add your opinion to it or your experience. But just take it step by step. You, you, none of this happens overnight. You're not going to suddenly be able to create viral content. You, you take it step by step. And I think just by growing, consuming, and starting with some engagement will build the foundation of confidence that you can then grow on. And hopefully you'll get to a point of, oh, actually, maybe I could post something. Maybe I could share this article and add my thoughts in its own original post. And before you know it, you'll be in a position where you're then comfortable to create something totally original. But it, you know, it takes time. Don't stress about it. Just take it day by day. Just start doing little things. Add a few people read some content, start adding a few comments, start liking posts. Just doing that is going to get your name out there and have a huge impact. But the consistency piece is the, the glue that kind of sticks it all together. So the advice I give to people is, is, is similar. Everything he just said, spot on. Um, I will hear the pushback saying, um, I don't know what to talk about, or I don't get engagement, so I don't do it. And so a couple things I say to people is uh, this. Number one, I say, have a take. Just have an opinion, all right? If all you're doing is liking comments and posts and that's it, that's your contribution, and or you can say, add a boy, you know, why bother? I mean, yes, you want to be seen, you want to say good posts, you want to, you want to be social, it's a conversation, but eventually have a take. You know, why is it a good post? Good post, I especially like this, right? Have a take. That's the first part. Second part is you don't know what to talk about? Brothers and sisters, you are on the phone every day. You are sending emails every day. You are having conversations with your clients every single freaking day. Your boss is on your ass, I swore, every single day saying, have you done this? Have you done that? Right? Every single one of those conversations, people are sharing with you something. You haven't updated the CRM with the close dates. My pipeline is stupid. Here's a post. You know, how often should we update a CRM? Do you rely on the close date? Right. What are best practices? Your customer saying to you, I can't afford this right now because interest rates are going up and we have uncertainty. There's a post. What's the impact of rising inflation and interest rates? We've seen it on the supply chain. What is it on our actual sales cycle? You know, it just take inspiration from what you're living every single day because that's what you know best because you're dealing with it right now. Finally, you say you get no engagement. I get it. Daniel's giving you the trick. It's, it's often it's you engage in other people's posts that drives traction back to your posts. But beyond that, understand that 90%, Daryl's quote, Daryl's stat, but I'm, I don't think I'm pretty confident in this. 
of people on LinkedIn are lurkers. So even, I cannot tell you how many people I've had say wonderful things to me and buy from me, and they've never once commented on my stuff. But they know me because they read my stuff. All right? So that's the power of that. Um, who does Daniel Disney go to in the social world to learn from? Who influences you? Who do you respect? Who, whose content do you seek out? That's a really good question. I surround myself with every LinkedIn social selling expert thought leader out there. Um, oh, again, I hate it when you put me on the spot, Daryl, because then I really struggle to think of names. My mind goes absolutely blank. But it's like the Academy Awards. He'll say one or two names, and then after we're done recording, he's going to say, I should have said five more names. That's exactly what will happen. Um, there's lots of great ones out there. I think it's a tricky one. I learn a lot about LinkedIn just from using it myself um, and, yep. you know, networking. But I guess I seek more from sales leaders, from real sales people. So the people that are using it, the people that are, you know, out there grinding. And yeah, that list is ever changing. As you kindly uh, said before we went live, I was uh, named on Salesforce's top 29 thought leaders. And there are some great people on there. Scott Lease. You know, Scott Lee's been sharing some amazing content recently. Amazing stuff. Marcus yep. Chan, again, really amazing content. Dale Dupree. I mean, there are loads yep. out there. Larry Long Jr. Well, all bring yep. different voices. And for me, it's great to see what they're doing and the content they're sharing, the engagement it gets to then really take away, okay, what's working, what's not working. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a two-part process. Learn from great people, but learn from practice. You know, the best way to learn is by doing, trying, testing. Um, you know, you'll learn a lot more from that. Your current book, The Ultimate LinkedIn Sales Guide. Um, why should I buy that? <laughs> it's the most up-to-date, comprehensive guide on LinkedIn out there. Whilst it is a sales guide, it's probably as relevant to marketing as it is to sales. But it's got everything, Daryl. It's got optimizing profiles, growing networks, sending messages, written audio, video, creating great content, strategy. It's the lot. I, You know me, Daryl. You know my journey. I wanted to create the most comprehensive book on selling, social selling, LinkedIn selling, and... That is it. And it's got a foreword by Jeb Blunt to top it off. Oh, look at that. That's the book to get, kids. I mean, seriously, if you're tackling LinkedIn, you can talk to me, you can talk to Daniel, you can follow all of our content, and you should. But I'll be honest with you, the success I started getting on LinkedIn all started because I bought a book called How to Write a Killer Profile by Brenda Bornstein. And that's all it was. It was just focused simply on the profile. And that automatically increased so many aspects as my searchability, getting found by recruiters. But more than anything, the remarks I have from people saying, oh my gosh, your, your profile is stunning. You must be somebody, even though I'm not, um, was that book. It was a how-to. So you get all that, what he's just talked about, plus everything else he's talked about on the Ultimate LinkedIn Sales Guide. You can get it on Amazon. It would be a great birthday gift for yourself because, hey, you deserve to buy yourself a gift. And everything else, here's one thing I will tell everybody. I'm a big believer in you got to invest in your own success. All right? So it's not expensive. Buy the damn book. Because I'll tell you this, if you apply one thing from that book that results in you getting one more commission check, I think there's a bit of an ROI there. So don't be stupid about it. This is your career. The more success you have, the faster you grow in your career, the more you'll be promoted, all that wonderful stuff, the more money you get. It's it's all goes back to the ultimate LinkedIn sales guide. Final question for you, Daniel. Uh, and by the way, that was not a commercial plug. That was me telling you that's literally what I did. You get the right book, it can tell you much. And then you see Daniel online, he's just going to reiterate what you've already read in the book and remind you why you need to do that. It's best practices. So no different than why you have a sales trainer now, more than likely, or you seek out sales trainers. They don't necessarily tell you anything you don't know, you've read or heard before, but they reiterate the importance of, yeah, I got to do that. Yeah, I, I, okay, I'm going to finally make an effort to do that. That's why, why you want them. Um, Video. Video on LinkedIn used to be over the top, and then it got scaled way back by the algorithm. Where are we today on video? Because I just don't see it like I used to. It generally probably generates some of the lowest forms of engagement, but I'll be honest, low engagement, often high conversion, high ROI, high generating of inbound opportunities or conversations. So it's a really tricky one. It should be a part of everyone's strategy, but it's... It, content, Daryl, as you know, it's all about variety. So 
just sharing video, not the best strategy. Just sharing text posts, not the best strategy. Try and do a bit of everything. One day text post, one day image, one day video, and that way you'll reach more people, you'll get to benefit from all the different types of engagement. But with video, because it's you, because they see you, it's as close to face to face, the conversion often is a lot higher than any other forms of content. So yes, you'll probably see lower engagement, but the impact is probably a lot higher. And I think moving forward, LinkedIn will start to really push the algorithm into it. So I think we'll start to see a growth in engagement as well. I would love to see that because I miss the engagement. I tell you, video worked great for me when it's in its heyday. I'm a, I love video. I think it's just personal. Uh, if you're going to use video, though, folks, make sure you use captions, all right? Lots of tools out there. DirtCheapRev.com is one example. There's AI tools. I used to use Zubtitle all the time. So you have options. Check it out. Um, we're way out of time. I'm like five minutes over my allowance. I could have kept on talking to you forever. Daniel, we need to do this again, not wait so long next time. Thank you so much, my friend. What, what, is, what is the one thing everybody listening to this right now needs to go action right now and change or implement in their daily selling routine as talked about in the ultimate LinkedIn sales guide? Do you know what? We, we talked about it here, Daryl. I'm going to reiterate it because it is the most important thing you can do. And it's going to be two things. Number one, grow your audience and start becoming more active, even if it's just commenting. Grow your network and start to build your voice. Just those two things. Do it two to three times a week minimum. And within a few weeks, you will be surprised by the results. Grow your network and start to find your voice. Do those things. You can thank me in a couple of months time. LinkedIn.com slash in slash Daniel Disney or the daily sales.net 850,000 followers. If you're not one of those, you are not with the cool kids. That's Daniel. I'm Daryl. Kids, another week is in the bag. Will we see you here next week? I hope so. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.